morning. Welcome to Join News. That's we're coming to you live from our studios in Kukum Limle. We on DTT because we're free to work. Coming up this morning, industrial action of Teu enters week two as the group vows not to rescind its decision despite the resolution of the tier two and overtime allowances. More as it warns it will not return to work until some outstanding issues are settled. Also, NMC Chairman Yao Buedwaya Boafo describes as dysfunctional and unproductive recent calls by the GGA for media houses to blacklist two politicians for aiding attacks on journalists. More as the GGA expresses shock and disappointment in NMC's comments, explaining all stakeholders were consulted before issuing the directive. And it's unfortunate that the comment is it is the responsibility of to provide a neighboring environment for journalists to thrive. After that, not you see NMC sanctioning journalists, media houses. About 10,000 victims of spillage of the Akonsom Bodam in the Northern District constituency are still living in tents and other makeshift structures five months after the devastating flooding. We are in Mepe this morning for more on this. And the Ghana Police Service has arrested five persons in connection with the murder of the owner of the Safari Resort in Jurapa in the Upper West region, popularly known as Jurapa, Dubai. We are live in Jurapa for some updates. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Do stay for details. Industrial action of the Tertiary Education Workers Union of Ghana has ended a second week from today. Tewu says the strike action will continue even though government has resolved the issue concerning their Tier 2 pension as well as overtime and extra duty, duty allowances. The group says there are some outstanding issues that remain unresolved. Reason the strike will continue. Excepts of that statement issued by Tewu and signed by the National President Suleiman Abdul Rahman reads and it's just coming up on your screens it says the Tewu uh, strike of the University of Ghana has entered uh, the, uh, the second week today and the strike was declared because of government's failure to respect the ruling of the National Labor Commission for payment of tier 2 funds to fund managers the payment of vehicle maintenance allowance to deserving staff without discrimination and the payment of overtime and extra duty allowance it further says government has since resolved the issue of tier 2 and also directed public universities that were affected to pay the overtime and extra duty allowance by si but silent on the vehicle maintenance allowance payment to deserving staff some of these issues remain unresolved as the, the employer since february 1 2024 has refused to resolve the issue of the vehicle maintenance allowance. The National Executive Council of the Tertiary Education Workers Union of Ghana in the public university therefore wishes to reiterate the ongoing strike action is to continue until further notice. And it says long live. Uh, Tewu GH on the campuses of public universities. I've been joined by the national president of Tewu, Suleimana Abdurrahman. Grateful for your time, Mr. Suleiman. Let's understand what has been uh, resolved so far. So, tier two, overtime, and extra duty allowances, correct? Yes. And thank you so much for having me this morning. Right. So what are the outstanding issues? Uh, the reason you uh, say your members should still uh, go on with the strike? Right. Mr. Abdurrahman, uh, Suleiman Abdurrahman is a national um, chairman of, the, of TEU. So, Abdul Rahman, if you are back, I'm asking uh, you about the outstanding issues. 
Yes, hello, uh, can you hear me well? Loud and clear, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much for the opportunity. Yes, and good morning to your listeners. So what happens is this. Uh, we declared a strike on the 1st of February 2024. And in the declaration of the strike, we demanded for three things. First was the tier two uh, funds payment to the fund managers. Second was the overtime and then extra to allowance payment to deserving staff. And the third one was working maintenance allowance payment to qualified staff. Now, government has resolved the tier two uh, issue and then also directed the public universities where right so there seemed to be a bad connection yes with the uh president of teo suleiman abdul rahman but the they say that the uh, industrial action will continue uh to uh, even though it enters week two and it says because there are outstanding issues that needs to be resolved by government. Mr. Abdul Rahman is back on Zoom. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. So I was explaining that we were having three issues uh, which we were requesting government to make sure that they resolve. The first issue had to do with the tier two. The second was the extra digital allowance and then the overtime. Government has resolved the issue of the tier two and then also written a letter to direct the public universities that was up. All right, so Mr. Abdul Rahman is uh, the president of TEU. He says that there are outstanding issues. Let's try and raise him on the phone to get more on this. Uh, but the issue mainly is that government has been able to settle the tier two pension uh, issue. Uh, government has settled over time and extra duty allowances, but he said there are outstanding issues. And so the strike continues. Mr. Rahman, good to have you back. So you were telling me about uh, the outstanding issues. Yes, please. So the outstanding issue has to do with the vocal maintenance allowance payment. And we demanded the government to direct the public investors who are not paying this allowance to our members to do so without any delay. Because what qualifies a member who have this vocal maintenance allowance is when you have a motorbike, they pay you the motorbike maintenance allowance. When you have a car, they pay you the car maintenance allowance. So um, the problem is, all of our members are having the bikes and then cars. And those who are having the car, car vehicles and, uh, how do you call it, uh, cars, decide not to pay them this allowance. They rather pay them the motorbike maintenance allowance. So we are asking that every member who has a car in the present meeting, which the auditor has confirmed in the public universe, must be paid car maintenance allowance. Because the condition says that. Well, the, the agreement says that if someone is having a bike free, you pay the person by free maintenance allowance. If someone is having a motorbike, you pay the motorbike maintenance allowance. So at what point will our member will be having a car and then you decide to pay the person motorbike, even though the person is having a car? So we think that this is very, very unfortunate on the part of uh, government and some of the management who are doing this. And we are asking government to make sure that they rectify that. And, they explain. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, so let me begin to add that NLC uh, rule on this issue, uh, that was last year, somewhere in uh, October, emphasizing that government should make sure they pay this uh, allowance for themselves. But we don't know why government refused to adhere to the ruling of NLC. And that is why we are embarking on the strike, and we are asking until this digital resolve and not follow the strike. Because we don't know what will happen if we suspend the strike or follow the strike. So we are asking that without any duty, that they should go ahead and then make sure that they issue a directive to the public that are affected uh, on payment of this time and time to our staff to, to do so without any duty. What, what has been the explanation from government? I mean, the reason why they haven't dealt with your car maintenance allowances? Yes, so when we appeared before government the last time, uh, I mean, appear at the end of the weather, 
last time. The government was only asking for a time, more time to do this. So we don't know why, I mean, uh, uh, NLC is not enforcing their ruling because uh, government do I mean, NLC do a ruling and government says they will comply, but they are not complying. But mind you, there to be the unions who were, I mean, the five orders of NLC, and now NLC will have rushed to the court seek an injunction uh, to compel the unions to comply. But when it comes to government, we, we, we show that NLC is not standing firm on their decision. So we are only asking NLC that they should make sure that they ask them to respect their decision and then expect, I mean, how to call it, respect the duty of it. I mean, the labor union is public interest. So how long do you intend to lay down your tools? Well, as long as government decides to drag us, I believe we have no option but to be on strike. And the strike is in stages. We, we, we have not removed everybody from the camp. But when we get to a point where we drown everybody, I believe we, 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 we if we don't think to get there. At what point would you withdraw everybody? I, I believe when we get there, the whole country will move. But we don't think to get there. All right. Are there signals that government is willing to meet these demands? Well, for now, I cannot say whether there's a signal or not. Because if I say there's a signal and there's no any direct system from government, it amounts to nothing. But, but, uh, so, uh, has government reached out to you for another meeting on this, as we know has happened before? Yes, we are on discussion behind the scenes, and we want to believe very soon there will be a meeting that will come, and we believe the issue to be addressed there. Grateful for your time. Suleiman Abdul Rahman is national president of Tewu. He says, as long as government does not resolve their vehicle maintenance allowance issues, the strike will be in full force. Let's get on to other stories. Chairman of the National Media Commission, Yabuedu Ayabuafu, has described as dysfunctional and unproductive recent calls by the Ghana Journalists Association for Media Houses to blacklist two politicians accused of aiding attacks on journalists. The GJA has declared the blackout on MP for Ewutu Senya East Mavis Hawakumsen and MP for Yendi Farouk Ali Mahama, both accused of assaulting journalists from Cape FM and City TV in the heat of the NPP's parliamentary primaries. The NMC chair, while condemning assaults on journalists, asked that victims explore legal avenues to fight such acts of impunity against journalists. To the recent puri, vicious, and violent attacks on journalists for exercising their primary obligation of forming our people. This has resulted in the equally unilateral decision of the GJA in calling for a boycott or blackout on such people. Whilst the approach is popular, it is dysfunctional. Many years ago, I, I courted this pleasure region chapter of the GJ issues such an order against the vice chancellor of KNUSC, Professor Ellis Otu. As is usual with some of our journalists, my dissent was taken as being too known. I was taken to the cleaners and described in very pejorative ways as a term quote in Fenimu, treacherous, traitor against journalistic interest. I still hold the position that whilst it is disheartening for journalists to be attacked violently, the unilateral resolve to black out or boycott is not the most productive reaction. We cannot fight impunity with impunity. I will support any effort to ensure that justice is done against all such deviant acts rather than black out or boycott. We must follow the, due, the rule of law and the due process. Condemning such acts is in order, but not the blackout or both. GJ President Albert Dumfo has however expressed shock and disappointment in the comments of the NMC chair. He describes the posture of the NMC chair as unfortunate, explaining that GJ exhausted all relevant processes before issuing its directive. What the NMC done to promote and ensure independence of the media? 
in the freedom of the media in this country. You abandon your call for your constitutional mandate and a journalist, a journalist, a veteran journalist for that matter who is part of us because today you are heading a state institution or a state organization which we think which is supposed to be independent who now disagree with a tall media body. We have 500 of these that came together to take this decision. So if you disagree with even DJ, you disagree with, are you saying you also disagree with Media Foundation? Disagree with Giba? Disagree with Print Park? It is in no, I dream be a We don't even know what we are doing. And it's unfortunate that this comment is it is the responsibility of the NMC to provide a neighboring working environment for journalists to try. After that, not, we see NMC sanctioning journalists, media houses, going to apologize, going to do this. One at all as the NMC sanction perpetrators of attack on journalists. He will tell you that. He will say that all this report didn't come before them. Meanwhile, during the invasion of the new TV studio, nobody reported to them. They were the first people to issue the statement. But nobody reported to them. When politicians, government officials attack journalists, you will sit down there and say you are waiting for a report to act. As NMC, we're supposed to protect journalists. So if you can't protect journalists and you cannot ensure uh, you cannot ensure a safety in the environment for journalists. Why would you disagree if we are taking abnormal decisions? Well, I've been joined by Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abraima. Grateful for your time this morning. Mr. Abraima, how do you react to this development of NMC describing GJA's directive to blacklist two politicians who allegedly attack journalists as dysfunctional and unproductive? Well, um, let me first of all say that I highly commend the Ghana Journalists Association, the leadership of the association, for their astuteness and uh, um, how resolute they've been of late in terms of defending the rights of journalists and uh, the efforts they are making to ensure that the constitutional guarantees for press freedom are, are, are enabled. Um, and it's on that basis that I, I feel completely disappointed in their statement by the National Media Commission. Uh, but I should say that it's not surprising because I've always said that one of the institutions that have completely failed in, in deciding its mandate in this country is the National Media Commission. And I think that the, the failure of the, uh, the, the commission has actually gotten worse over the last uh, few years uh, that perhaps Mr. Abouafou has been the, 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 the chairman of, of, of the commission. I mean, as the GJA president said, what has the NMC been doing in terms of the constitutional mandate to ensure the highest journalistic standards and, and promoting press freedom in this country? It's almost absolutely nothing. And for me, it is therefore not surprising that today, you know, the, the, the NMC would occasionally, um, you know, issue a statement and people would completely disregard it. I think it is as a result of the, some of these um, attitudes, you know, by, by the leadership of the NMC that has gotten the NMC to a position where literally no one respects whatever um, they do. So I, I feel completely disappointed in what the, the, the chairman has said. In fact, he tries to allude to a decision that he made some years ago, and, and in, 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 in relating to that, he doesn't say that, oh, I realize that I made a wrong decision. But then his problem is that he was condemned. So the fact that you are condemned means that, you, you, I mean, the action you took was wrong. Is he saying that <clears throat> all that he endorses is maybe actions that attracts applause? I mean, journalists over the period have been beaten, have been harassed, you know, in, in, in one instance, in the case of Swale, even killed. Our press freedom ratings have gone to the lowest, you know, over two decades. And the body that is supposed to ensure the highest journalistic standards and press freedom as provided for by the Constitution is saying that if the, the, the GJA is taking actions to ensure that people begin to see that, look, if you, if you harass or beat up a journalist, there can be consequence. That is wrong. 
And I'm surprised that he, takes, he says that is a unilateral decision. What, what does he mean by that? Because these are statements that have been issued. When the first statement was issued on Howard Kumsen, subsequently the Media Foundation issued a statement to declare our full support for what the GJ had done. GIBA is subsequently issued a statement to say that it fully endorses what the GJ has done. In the case of Farouk Mahama, it was a joint statement that was issued by the GJA, the Media Foundation, GIBA, Prime Park. So when he says that it's a unilateral decision by the GJA, uh, is it that he doesn't follow what is happening? Or what? So for me, it's a complete disappointment. But like I said, that is why perhaps we've gotten to a point where they've run down the National Media Commission to a point where no one respects it anymore. Given that, I mean, all the issues we've reported to the police have really not yielded the, the outcome that we want or the justice for these journalists who've been attacked over the period, ideally, what should be the way forward in resolving the unwarranted attacks on journalists, I mean, going about their duties? Well, I think we've gotten to a point where all arsenals must be deployed. Um, as a regional organization working across West Africa, we, we, don't, we don't normally um, take these decisions lightly in terms of, you know, issuing an open statement to endorse whatever the GJ has done. In the past, if you recall, there were people who were even thinking that the, National, uh, the, the, the Media Foundation has issues with the GJA, the Media Foundation is trying to undermine the GJA, and so on and so forth. And it was because we had a leadership of the GJA at the, at the time that wasn't effective, you know. And so given that we are at a point where impunity in terms of abuses against journalists is becoming the order of the day, we have to deploy all arsenals. Of course, the police administration remains our law enforcement agency, and whatever happens, we have to report to the police, as has been done in both instances that, I mean, in terms of Hawa Kumsen and Farouk Mahama. We have to, as, as, when, as and when it is possible, resort to legal measures, and that is not out of the way. And in fact, what the DJ has done is part of what has to be done to draw attention to the fact that, look, journalists cannot be just beaten, and then when they are beaten, the NMC is saying that when we issue a statement, that is enough. We've been doing that over time. And people have been saying, oh, but well, after statement, what next? Oh, after statement, what next? And you are saying that you are satisfied with the fact that, you know, journalists are beaten, statements are issued, and then it hangs on there. The NMC was charged to manage the coordinated mechanism on safety of journalists. As we speak, what has happened? In fact, some of us fought against the idea of it being hosted directly by the Ministry of Information. And I can say that it is part of the agitation that some of us put out that resulted in the Ministry agreeing that, look, okay, this thing should go to the National Media Commission, as we have advocated. It got there, and nothing has happened. There have been occasions where I have conversations with people at the Ministry, and they're like, well, you know, we've done our bit. So nothing works with the National Media Commission. I've always said that, look, how many years? 30-something years now. The commission doesn't even have a website. You have a chairman who has been an editor before, has been a managing director, I mean, a, 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 a senior person at Graphic before, has been a, a GJA leader before, has been executive secretary of the National Media Commission before, till date as we speak. If you need, if you want to know who are the commissioners of the National Media Commission, there's not even a website for you to go to. A common website. There is no website in this age of digitalization. The NMC doesn't even have a website that you can even go to, to to look at what are the provisions, who are the commissioners, what decisions have been made, what what work what work is going on. And yet we have commissioners sitting there receiving big monies every time and driving four by four. That is saying that that is what the constitution envisages. And if they cannot, if, if if the chairman cannot do anything at all, the best he can do is not to also impede efforts that are being made to ensure that the safety of journalists is guaranteed in this country. I, I think that maybe if he has, he has, he has no work to do, it's better that he stays there than to now take steps to, you know, stampede and impede efforts that are being made by others to ensure that the rights of journalists are respected. I think that is completely... I mean, untenable for, mm. for him to have made the statements that he made. There are those who feel that the NMC's work, I mean, there's some seeming political influence in the NMC's uh, work. Are you one of those who believe in that view? Well, um, it, it, it remains a perception. This is the first time in the history of the National Media Commission that you have a representative of the president being the chairman of the NMC, of course. 
It is not the president who appointed him as chairman. Subsequently, after the appointment or, or, by, or the nomination by the president, the commissioners then decided to vote him as their chair. But it is significant to note that it is the first time we are having a representative of the president, somebody that the president trusts to represent him on the National Media Commission, being the chairman. And so for me, I wouldn't begrudge those who would say that you, the president cannot nominate somebody or have somebody to represent him and that person goes to work in a way that would undermine the interest of the president. And so for me, the, 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 the current leadership of the NMC, particularly the chairman, should know that he has everything to do to prove that the fact that he is representing the president does not mean that he is working in the interest of the president and his party. But if he goes the way he is going, then of course it further en entrenches that perception that well he was vo he was put there by the president and he was voted as chairman and he must do what is in the interest of the president and his party. And I, I, I believe that, as I said, he must begin to do things, you know, in a way to prove that he's not just there to, 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 to work in the interest of the government and, and the president who put him there. Otherwise, um, I think that we can only get to a point where we would all believe that when it is about the, the government and, and party people, MPP party people, then, of course, beating up a journalist uh, requires just the issue of a statement. But maybe if it is uh, against an opposition person, then it is fine. Because people would say that if these blackouts were issued against certain functionaries of the NDC, perhaps his tone would have been different. And I don't want to, I don't want to say that I would believe that, but he must begin to act in ways that would not create a perception that he's working just in the interest of the president and the party. I'm grateful for your time. Suleiman Abraima is executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. Let's go to Mepe. About 10,000 victims of the spillage of the Akosombo Dam in the North Tong constituency are still living in tents and other makeshift structures five months after the devastating flooding. This is according to Member of Parliament for the area, Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, who has facilitated the construction of two alternative housing schemes to house up to 600 people, but says a lot more help is required. Former President John Mahama, who is backing the parliamentary probe into the spillage, says government has been insensitive to the plight of the victims. Kukwa Sante has the rest of the story from Mepe. It's been five months since the floodgates of the Akosumbo Dam was open, leaving in its wake devastation never seen in decades. So many people reduced to living in tents with their entire livelihood wiped off with the water now receded and the people trying to build back their lives so much help is still needed for now the focus of mp for nofton one of the worst affected constituencies samuel kujita blackwa and his partners is to relocate as many of the victims as possible and risk them in decent accommodations the mp has now opened the second alternative housing project to house at least 300 families. We have been able to mobilize those resources and put together the second housing project, which we are calling the North Town MP and Partners Safe Alternative Housing Initiative. From tonight, 300 people who are living in refugee like tents in Dagome. In Agbetiko, in Aveime, in Dofwadidoma, in Fojoku, from tonight they can have access to decent, modern accommodation and they can have their dignity restored. The MP says it is unacceptable. The government is failing its responsibilities. We're waiting for the central government to commence homes. How long are people going to be living like refugees in their own country, in their own hometown? How long? How long are we going to be living in tents? Very soon, the rainy season will be upon us. Those tents cannot save us. So His Excellency Nana Dodankwa Kufwado and Vice President Alaji Mahmoud Remember 
your oath of office. Former President John Dramani Mahama, who is backing the parliamentary probe into the spillage of the Akosumbo Dam, is also accusing government of turning a blind eye to the plight of the victims. I, I urged the Speaker of Parliament, after he ruled that there should be a public inquiry, I urged him to go ahead and set up the committee so that a bipartisan committee so that it can hold a public inquiry. This inquiry must be televised so that the whole of Ghana can see it transparently in order that we know exactly what happened so that it will not be repeated again. So let me appeal to the President Nana Kupado and his Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya to be more responsive and sensitive to the plight of the victims of the Akosombo Dam spillage and immediately get to work to commence resettling the victims. The insensitivity of government to the plight of these victims is unacceptable. Chiefs in the area, helpless and furious. The Volta Regional House of Chiefs is calling on government and DRA for a complete resettlement of the impacted communities that have suffered as a result of what VRA did to us. More than 10,000 persons still have to be relocated to be moved away from shelters like these, which have been described as inhumane. The challenge we have now is uh, accommodation, like we need proper structure. The tent, uh, if you enter in the morning, you feel comfortable. But during the afternoon, there's so much heat, so you can't even stay in it. Yes, and even if it rained, last time it rained, the whole place was so disorganized. But at least while these people wait for their government to come to their aid after budgeting more than 200 million cities, Samuel Okujita, Blackwell and his partners are doing their bit to help ameliorate the suffering of the people and put them back to living decent lives. Reporting for Joy News, Bekwa Sante, Mefe, North Tong, Volta Region. President Ekofuado has described as unfortunate comments by former President John Mahama questioning the authenticity of the recent West Africa Senior School Certificate examination results. According to him, some invigilators relax on the job as teachers aid students in answering questions. It comes after the Education Minister, Dr. Ayose Duchum, announced that this year's WASI results were the best since 2015. What the exams are in many places, one checking quadrant, they let the children cheat freely. You go to places and the teachers are conniving with the children to cheat. The effect of this will be seen later because you certify these children, you say he's of this standard, either basic BEC or SSC, and that child will use that certificate, go abroad. To a school and they'll find that in Ghana your qualification is not up to what you say it is. It is, a, it is going to affect this nation. I think we're just doing it anytime there is us come. You say, oh, the children have performed better than they ever performed before. You know, and we all know what is happening in the system. But addressing the 187 speech and prize given there at the Wesley Girls High School in Cape Coast, President Ekofuado says the criticism lacks merit. It is a pity, though, that the sad nature of aspects of contemporary Ghanaian politics drove some otherwise allegedly responsible people, including a former president and perennial presidential candidate in the integrity of the results happily without any foundation and attribute these results to cheating. Students of Wesley Girls High School, Wegehe Girls, do you cheat in examinations? I don't know will send a strong message to those who express 
this unfortunate, misguided sentiment. Away from politics, the Ghana Police Service has arrested five persons in connection with the murder of the owner of the safari resort in Jurapa in the Upper West region, popularly known as Jurapa, Dubai. The arrest follows initial investigations by the regional crime scene management team upon their visit to the crime scene. According to a statement from the police, Eric Johnson was found lying in a pool of blood at his private residence on Sunday. The Inspector General of Police has deployed a team of investigators and experts led by the Director General of the CID to work with the Upper West Regional Police Command to ensure a thorough investigation into the incident. Assets of the statement released by the police read the Ghana Police Service has to Today, 11 February, arrested four more people in connection with murder of Mr. Eric Johnson, Chief Executive Officer of Cozy Hill Hotel at Jurapa in the Upper West Region, bringing the number of suspects so far arrested to five. The statement continues to say the suspects Dukuri Foster, Brian Makassim, Bayou Felix, and Michael Kluge who are all workers at the Cozy Hill Hotel are in police custody assisting the investigation together with suspect Kumbata Kweku, who was earlier on arrested. Investigation continues to bring the perpetrators to face justice. I've been joined uh, on the line by Rafiq Salam, who has been monitoring this uh, for us. Rafiq Salam, uh, what has police uncovered in its investigation so far concerning the murder of Eric Johnson? Uh, the police, uh, for now, are tired uh, about the issue. But what I can tell you is that the team that the Inspector General of the Ghana Police Service has deployed to come to the Force Region, uh, the police service here are still waiting for their arrival, uh, for them to move straight to Jirapa to uh, uh, start uh, the, to continue the investigation that was started yesterday. As you rightly said, so far five persons have been uh, arrested, and then also, and then the body of the uh, of the chief executive officer of uh, Europe and Dubai is currently deposited at the Apple Regional Hospital uh, pending further investigation. For now, um, nothing is happening. Uh, now they are still waiting for the arrival of these uh, track CIDs uh, to come and then uh, continue with the investigation. Rafik, who are these five guys who have been arrested? Uh, we know they are staff of Cozy Hills Hotel, but what do we know about them? I mean, their, their personality. Um, I think uh, the, 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 the first person has to be with the security man who is alleged to have, uh, to have uh, you know, opened the gate when the unknown assailant uh, came uh, uh, using the stolen car of uh, Eric Johnson. And when he honked and then he opened him uh, to move out of the car. And the other person who is known among all is somebody who is the project coordinator or the project manager of the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, uh, also the or the deputy chief executive officer of Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, and the person of a uh, Michael Kulge. Uh, Kulge is somebody who is very close to uh, uh, Eric uh, Johnson, and he says that uh, he stalwart, uh, he's somebody who you know who is always with him, and he knows that in, he's alleged to have known the ins and outs of him, and so the police have arrested this personality so that they would help uh, in further investigation. You, you spend the most part of your Sunday in Jirapa. What can you report of the mood in the community where Eric Johnson lives? The mood in Jirapa is not the best. It's one that is filled with sadness, uh, grief, and the people are somehow angry uh, with what the alleged uh, uh, or what the unknown assailant uh, has done. The people think that what he has done it will be give a drawback of the region's uh, development. They are thinking that he didn't only uh, stop uh, Eric Johnson multiple times, but they have stopped it, not only the people of Jirapa, but the people of the entire uh, northern enclave. And, and the staff of uh, Royal Cozy Hills? I uh, tried to speak to them. Um, the mood there is one of uh, somber, and also all of them were tight lipped. And even when I even try to put a question to them, whether they are aware of what was right uh, at the private residence of uh, Eric Johnson, they didn't want to speak on the issue. Uh, they said that they were waiting for what their management will tell them. Uh, but they were open, the place is open, and then expecting more people 
uh, expecting people to troop in, uh, you know, for their weekends. So, but not many people were there. Well, it's it, it's it's like it's a, it's like a ghost town. You know, not many people. Not not, not a single you know reveler was there uh, at at the main hotel uh, that I went to. If only the workers were there. Have you been able to speak with any family member? Um, the only closest family member that I spoke with is uh, the chief of Jirafa, Justice uh, Bina, the only one uh, who confirmed to me about the death of uh, Eric and somebody who's really deeply worried about the issue, somebody that who's also very close uh, to Eric Johnson, and then uh, he's the only person that I've been able uh, to speak to. Do you know if Eric Johnson had any um, scaffold or he had any misunderstanding with anybody? I mean, have you picked any such information? Uh, for now, I haven't uh, picked uh, any information regarding any scaffold or misunderstanding with anybody. The only thing that I can tell you is that there was a press conference that was held uh, somewhere around December, was it? October, that mentioned his name uh, as somebody who, uh, who was, uh, what do you call it, uh, putting his neck into the Jeffrey Chippency affairs, and he even uh, tried to clear his name by taking the matter to court. Uh, that's the only thing that I know uh, uh, of. But uh, the, the police or the people who are well uh, vested in some of these things need to do that investigation. But if not, I'm not aware of any, any disagreement that he has with anybody apart from this issue. Rafik Salam is a, a West Region correspondent bringing us updates of the murder of the owner of Jirapa Dubai, Eric Johnson. We'll bring you more as we get from the police and from our reporters. Let's take a break. When we return, we'll be bringing you business. <music> Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Zenit Bank Ghana and the Africa Guarantee Fund have signed a memorandum of understanding to support small and medium enterprises to expand. The initiative will enable the first 100 SMEs benefit from funding from the bank at low interest rates. Here's more in this report. The Trade Queen Africa pageant is geared towards improving trade activities. According to the World Bank, SMEs represent about 90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment. Ghana, SMEs are crucial drivers of the economy, employing, contributing more than 70% of the private sector output, surpassing global averages. Speaking to the media after the signing ceremony, the managing director of Zenith Bank, Henry Oruzuribo, said it is important to support SMEs with low interest funds, particularly to women. We entered into a partnership with the Development Bank of Ghana. The Development Bank of Ghana gives chief finance, which we are going to extend to all these SMEs at a relatively cheaper cost. And our internally as a bank, we have decided to categorize the SMEs. And we place them on an account series whereby even transaction costs, COT, they pay the list you can talk about. So we are aware of this. There is no way saying you want to help somebody when you are charging the person so much. So we are looked into all this holistically and we are sure with what we are put in place that all the MSMEs will not have any other opportunity, any other chance but to come and enroll in what we are doing in Zenith. On his part, the Director General of the Africa Guarantee Fund, West Africa, Benjamin Peglo, said the aim of the initiative is to lift the vulnerable out of poverty. We bring the dedication to, to SMEs. There's a unit dedicated to, to SMEs. We don't see it everywhere. We don't see it with other banks. Uh, second, the reach. Uh, they have 42 branches across the countries. So for us, this is extremely important because the first goal uh, for AGF is the impact, social impact. And we want to measure it outside of just the urban areas. And we can see the way Zenit Bank is dealing with it. They are reaching outside of Accra. They are measuring their impact and they want to do more. They are extremely aggressive uh, about it. And they committed to even lend money at better conditions to the SMEs because they're having a discussion with the, the, the DBG. 
Speaking on behalf of the Bank of Ghana, Deputy Director in charge of Banking Supervision Department, Ismail Adam, said the central bank will continue to persuade banks to lend to the SME sector in order to grow the economy. So Bank of Ghana, we have challenged the banks to establish dedicated desks to design specific products that will meet the needs of SMEs. And our hope is that that will address the challenges that SMEs are facing. In other news, government raised 6.96 billion CDs via Treasury bills, the biggest so far this year. That's according to the T-bills auctioned by the Bank of Ghana. Interest rates also fell again for the sixth week running since the start of the year. Here's more. The government recorded 51.8% over subscription of the T-bills auction. About 3.04 billion cities, approximately 43.7% came from the 91-day bill. The uptake were 2.93 billion cities. The 364-day bill followed with 2.28 billion cities of the bid standard. All of the bids were accepted. For the 182-day bill, 1.62 billion cities were tendered in which all the bids were taken. Meanwhile, interest rates fell for the sixth consecutive week. The 91-day bill went down by 30 basis points to 28.29%. That of the 182-day bills also used to 30.43% from the previous 31.39%. The one-year bill also dropped to 30.99% from the preceding weeks of 31.39%. And that's it for this segment. The news continues after the break. Come back to join us. Let's quick to the rest of our story. Some youth in their Sawasa constituency are advocating for the completion of three AstroTurf projects initiated by the present government. According to them, the government had assured the construction of these astrotefs with the with the aim of nurturing local talent. Unfortunately, the aspirations have been crushed as construction has come to a halt, causing the once vibrant football culture to fade away. Joy News' says Mahmoud Mohamed Nouruddin has more. We have about three pitches in Aswansi, which have, have, have been abandoned, Highlanders, Abu School Park, and that one we are standing behind us as I'm speaking now. Our wish and dream is to have these parks being built so that we can have more players in our community because Aswansi have produced a lot of players. Some of the players that we have produced are like somebody like Dogomoro, we have Ishak Debra, Anma Jerry. And even as I'm speaking now, we have some of the young players, like Frank and Champo, a black star player. The astro the sword, uh, the sword has been cut. So we know when the sword is cut from a government project, it needs to be completed. But per the documentation as we heard, that everything is complete. But looking at the surrounding, nothing shows. We know government control how it goes. We have faces of it. Okay, per the documentation, they say it's complete, but we don't know. Uh, the place has been like this. And the youth don't have a place to train, so they usually play the, uh, football. So, as you can see, some of the nets have all, all torn down due to, I mean, one or two things. So, it's a big debt to the uh, country again, which we have to renovate again. So, so why I see a constituency rich in talent and dreams, but hidden beneath the shadows of neglect lies a symbol of broken promises and unfulfilled potential. So we feel very discriminated in a situation whereby this started before others, the likes of the Chamsu, Bantama and others. They've seen this way after this has been started, but still this has been completed and it's even been patronized. And we are the same set of people that are using those facilities. Uh, so we have uh, our elders who went to the uh, municipal to inquire. They, they came with a feedback that the pit has been done since it completed. That, that is what they told us. That is what our elders told us that there is no, there's nothing to be done again because the pit has been done already. 
So we have made some feedback. We did some demonstrations, let me say two, three times, and yet still nothing seems to be happening. So we don't know what to do again. That's why we are pleading to the right authorities, authorities to take charge. The astroturfs, which were expected to be the heartbeat of the community, now it the silence of neglect. How? First one, Yadika Islanders, and I join us. Since you Koshia Islanders, you have Bobo, Abu Boni, and I'll call one side, and I'm out for Bobo on one side. Since you do cry, I don't know, Honum, Uqua, Ubu say, I deny a bassa. I didn't know I was a bassa because of Zongo. Zongo, you name in Penufo, in Penufo, I was Zongo, no, or moon like Basso the Kishi Zongo, Muni Akuma and Mazongo. Mazongo. The Asai Islanders also the same thing. I didn't know what I was saying, sir. I'm for yes, Remo. Yes, Remo. We need him. Monsoor engineer, we need Mazongo. And do baby, and my. Now, I think also now, I want to have Bumudi. I can't say my idea is bad. And my always, I'm as a baby. I'm not. Now, I did him what I'm not saying. I can't from H Remo. And that's how we wrap up the bulletin this morning. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Log on to myjohnline.com for more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12.